In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us meditate the immense gift that the Lord gave us in this holy place. And that is chapter 5 of the Gospel according to Matthew. It's considered that the we Christians have two Magna Cartas. One here in the Gospel, directly said by the Lord, which are the Beatitudes. And then the letter to the Corinthians, chapter 13, written by St. Paul, which is the hymn to authentic love. The two Magna Cartas have to be in your homes. I recommend that you buy here. I recommend that you buy here the holy card with the Beatitudes and that you frame them and put them in an important place in your homes. Because why? Because we can we can never forget that Jesus in this place climbed up the mountain and we're going to see why he climbed up the mountain to teach us, to teach us. We, the, his followers, his disciples, what is the true path to happiness? not only in heaven, but also here on earth. Like I was saying in the meditation in the Mass, if the kingdom of God is in our hearts, and our hearts then should be formed in the school of the Beatitudes. From this place, what I said, St. John Paul II stayed here, and St. John Paul II called the entire church in the year 2000, and then he repeated it in World Youth Day in Toronto. The exact same phrase, we can say that it was like, like a, a call out, an order for the entire church. The world today, what it needs are men and women of the Beatitudes. That is, when John Paul II said, what the world needs, he's giving us the remedy for all the evils. And so, all the times that he said the world needs this, we have to pay attention because he was giving remedies. But he considered that a time in the world was coming, he had a prophetic gaze which is being fulfilled, that a time was coming in the world where all Christian values were being turned around and that the values of the world would, would take precedence over all humanity. And even Christians were going to embrace them in such a way that they would stop being disciples of Christ without realizing it. And the Lord came to save us, but to save man, or the person, man, woman, that means all of his being. He not only came to save us from sin, which is the first and foremost, because no one with sin can live in the kingdom of the Lord. And that's why when there's mortal sin, we have to confess immediately so that we don't lose the grace of being in communion with the kingdom. But also, the Lord not only came to save us from sin, the Lord came to redeem all of our humanity, to recreate us. Why? Because after original sin, everything else became disordered, disoriented. We didn't lose. We didn't lose the essence. We didn't lose who we are, but much of who we are was disoriented. We didn't lose the desire to love, but oftentimes we love erroneously. We didn't lose the desire of happiness, but many look for happiness in whatever form, whatever place, and no matter the cost. We we don't lose the desire to seek the good, but sometimes to look for the good, we use means that are evil. And many times people say, the, the end justifies the means. But that's Christians, that's not true. The act, in order for it to be good, it has to be good in its intention, in its way of carrying it out, so that the end would be moral. And what I want to show you is that Everything that God gave us, He 
our vocation, our essence, who we are. He didn't remove that with, or with sin, but it did become disordered. It became distortioned, distorted. We were created to love, and that's our true happiness, is to give ourselves fully for others. However, with sin, we lose the capacity to seek love and and we forget in love to seek it to be a donation but it's the opposite we, we wanted everything to be for me so it's selfishness and so selfishness begins to govern govern and greater strength in the human heart and so what the Lord is going to do everything that he teaches everything that he does everything that he says it's for the conversion of the human person in its entire in his entirety which begins with conversion of the human heart why does the Lord take advantage of this moment to give the Beatitudes because if we read some verses prior to this his fame has extended even all the way to Syria everyone knows that the Lord is here that he teaches that many believe that he's the son of God that he's healed that he's delivered and, it, and his fame begins to spread and multitudes start to gather and that's why when the Lord knows that when multitudes are coming he knows it's because his fame has extended of the things that he has done and so he takes advantage and he says I will teach you the real reason why I came that all my signs and all my acts of love are acts of mercy that all of us are called to do but the Lord doesn't didn't just come to do acts of mercy he came to teach us to be men and women new men and women recreated returning returning to original innocence and that's why here he gives us the Magna Carta to return for that return and that's why I said there's eight steps to get to heaven and they sound very nice but they're very difficult to live they're very demanding the, the Beatitudes are very demanding and that's why people don't live them even though we can call ourselves Christian or even if supposedly we are very close to the Lord and brothers and sisters the Beatitudes is our point of discernment of authentic Christianity a leader that doesn't live, who doesn't live the Beatitudes, don't follow that leader because because he's he or she's a leader in his own way, not with the heart of Christ. He's not a good shepherd. The Beatitudes, as the Father was saying in the homily, quoting Cardinal Ratzinger, is the figure of Christ. If we want to know how the person of Christ was how the heart of the Lord was it's described in the Beatitudes the face of Christ is drawn in the Beatitudes the personality of Christ is manifested in the Beatitudes the way in which he wants us to live because he didn't just come to give us a teaching he came to transform us so that we can live a new lifestyle if not it would just be theory and the word became flesh and so the Lord wants us to learn what is the kingdom of heaven but at the same time he wants to teach us to live in the kingdom and to live in the kingdom we have to leave the Beatitudes and that's why even for our own reflection, personal reflection or examination of conscience I have to see myself how am I living in the kingdom how inside of the kingdom or how is the kingdom living inside of me living the Beatitudes I imagine that moment brothers and sisters and I always get very emotional to come here because there's details that are so clear in the Beatitudes so the Lord wants us to sit in this school and that school is to teach us to live the Lord wants us to teach wants to teach us how to live like he wants to teach us how to suffer how to love how he wants to teach us to be members of the kingdom of his father he wants to teach us to be children of his father in him who is the son of the father and so notice that the Lord is here and you see that multitudes are coming 
Multitudes are approaching, some walking, other coming in the boat on the on the sea, from the sea. And the Lord, who is at the level of the lake, when the multitude arise, what does he do? He climbs up this mountain. Why did he climb a mountain to speak to us about this? Every time that the Lord is going to speak to us something that's very, very important, it takes place on a mountain. Why does he climb the mountain? And the mountain also has to climb with him. If they want to listen to him, they have to climb up because in that climbing up, there's a symbolism. The Lord comes to elevate the human person to his true dignity and his true virtue. And the virtues, brothers and sisters, are not attained only asking them. They're attained by exercising them. That is, we have to climb. It's difficult to climb up a mountain, right? Well, it's difficult to break with the pattern, the inclinations of the flesh with the low passions, which not everything else are low passions. But yes, we do have, and we have to recognize them. To break those low, in, low, those low passions, low inclinations, to climb up the Beatitude mountain. And so the Lord wants to elevate us to live them because we were created in the Beatitude. In, in Eden, the Beatitudes were lived. And the Beatitudes are happiness, peace, joy. But man, fallen man, fell because of sin. And so, and so then the Lord says, come up and climb. I'm going to elevate them by showing them the path of elevation of their humanity so that they could be fully human. Brothers and sisters, there's an error that we listen to sometimes. Oh, I'm sinful because I'm only human. No, that's not true. I sin because of my fallen human nature. In my humanity, I have an area that's fallen. That's called concupiscence. But not because I am human is that I sin, but rather because Adam and Eve were human persons. Human persons. But out of rebel, out of being rebels, out of not trusting, they fell. And so they enter into human nature, original sin enters, and then we have a wound. And the wound that makes us like have like a force or a strength that inclines us towards sin. And then Jesus comes to elevate us. And so I'll notice all those whom Jesus heals, paralytic, the hemorrhaging woman, Mary Magdalene, and then others at the end, he says, get up, rise. And the Lord, what he wants to tell us with the Beatitudes is, get up, rise up, live for what my Father created you. Live true happiness of the human heart. Live true humanity, which is what truly make you happy. Yes, with the difficulties, we can't deny that because it's a continuous choice. To live the Beatitudes is a continuous choice because there's a tendency in us to not want to be poor of spirit. Not to be instruments of peace, especially when war is at stake. When there's there's tendencies in us contrary to the eight beatitudes. When someone persecutes us, what's our natural tendency? Our fallen natural tendency to defend ourselves and to fight, to retaliate, for vengeance. And if we can't, well, let's speak poorly of the person. And the Lord says, and if the Lord says, when they perse persecute you, rejoice, rejoice. And brothers and sisters, one says, that's impossible. No, it's not impossible. Remember the first centuries, the martyrs. What would infuriate the Romans? That they were smiling and they were happy going to the Colosseum to be killed. When they were going to be eaten by the lions, they were rejoicing and singing happily. And so, the Beatitudes are not impossible to be lived. 
but they require a serious decision and a serious commitment to say, if I am Christian, my call is to live as a man and woman of the Beatitudes and to have that path as a goal of life, a plan of life, the Beatitudes. And so, all of your life, you're going to be checking it in relation to these eight points of reference, main points of reference, and that's why the octagonal church, that our lives may have an octagonal church, that it may be an octagonal church that reflects each one of the Beatitudes. And so there's another detail that calls my attention and that the multitudes, the multitudes climb. Notice from every single place that they came from, from Syria, they came from Galilee, from Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, the other side of the Jordan River. How many people came? And when the Lord makes them climb up, what's the first thing that happens? That His Apostles, I imagine that the, they're passing by the multitudes because the Lord walked quickly. He always walked quickly. And why did He walk quickly? I have my theory, you don't have to believe me, apart that He was used to walking. And so we've lost the capacity to walk and since we're always going in the car, we have loosened the potentialities of the human of our humanity because we're in a comfortable culture. But I think Jesus walked quickly because the Lord would say, and He tells us in the Gospel, and I love that scripture verse, walk meanwhile you have the light. And this is a discernment for each one of us. Meanwhile, I understand and I have light, I have to walk. Meanwhile, I have strength, I have to walk. Meanwhile, I have the opportunity to go to Mass every day. I have to do it because I don't know if later on I'll be sick or I'll die. Meanwhile, I have the opportunity to get involved in an apostle. I have to do it. Meanwhile, we have the lights, we have to walk. And so the Lord walked because in a certain way, He would be here, He would only be here three years. And He had to do much with us in those three years and walk quickly, force the multitudes to walk quickly. That's why, brothers and sisters, in the Christian life, slowness does not exist. Slowness does not exist. The Lord is calling me to go to Mass daily. I am discerning it. What are you going to discern? I, since I hear so many things, there's people who say, men and women, what are you doing with your life? And I find them. I'm discerning my vocation. And they've been discerning eight years. And how, are, how do they pray? How do you pray eight years to discern your vocation? That's why the Lord says, Peter, leave everything and follow me. And Peter would go quickly. There's so much to discern. What is so much to discern that when the Lord calls you, just go. But that's how we are, brothers and sisters. How many New Year's resolutions, or maybe if we've done the same pilgrimage and we have those resolutions, fulfill them because the Lord has spoken to you. So let us not go off a tangent. I'm going to go back now. The slowness is not part of the Christian life. It's part of the Christian life to discern, but a discernment does not take eight years. That means that you're not really discerning. A discernment is a serious prayer. If it's something serious accompanied by fasting, and the Lord will illumine you because He wants you to act quickly. He's the one who wants you to act quickly. And so, as I was saying, the next thing that happens, I imagine among some multitudes, of the, and the apostles are hurrying to get draw close to the Master. And Scripture says, the apostles arrive and they sit next to Him. This is very important. There's a sign here. True apostles of the Lord always have to be close to listen. Listen to the Lord. And that's why they climb quickly, because they climb and they sit next to Jesus. They were not part of the multitude, not because they were the elite. In the Christian life, I really want you to know this. The eliteness does not exist. It does not exist. That's a worldly 
term. Only those well, who exist are those who are called and called to greater commitment and greater responsibility and therefore to carry more of the cross. And so the Christian elite are the ones who die with him crucified. Are those the ones that are truly called to respond to his word. And so they sit and why? Because they have already learned that that the call that their call is to sit in the school of Jesus. This is a seminary of the apostles. Three years of seminary. You they saved because today it's six or seven years. They were in seminary three years and there were three because they were with the master of the masters. But even then they didn't learn much. The Holy Spirit helped them. But they sit next to him and here comes the teaching. If we want to listen to the Lord truly speaking to our hearts we have to go sit close to him and where are we going to go sit close to him in the blessed sacrament because that's where he is speaking to us and so he begins to teach with these words which are the Beatitudes brothers and sisters the Beatitudes are the direct response to the need of the human heart to be happy we were created to be happy. We were created to be happy permanently. Because of sin, we lost that happiness. And suffering entered. But in us is a desire of holiness. And that's why we're always looking for it. The person who says that they want to be happy, there's a little problem. And we have to send that person to therapy. Like the person that no matter the cost seeks the supposed happiness that doesn't last anything. And a false happiness, not only is it short, but it's also, it leaves you even less happy, which happens to many of our young people. That they look for happiness in many ways, like the world offers them, and then it's the generation of the anxiety pills. When, in our times, when we were young, young people took anxiety pills. Well, because they were looking for happiness outside, outside the path of God, and that happiness lasted an hour. And then they remained completely unhappy and anxious. Because then they think that they have to be doing and doing and repeating to look for happiness. And so then there comes the addictions in all the senses. So the Lord is going to show us that He came to make us happy. Notice how interesting. He came to make us happy, but it's a happiness that is not what the world offers. It's the happiness of the kingdom, which is happiness which is interior. That no one gives it to you, only God does. That it doesn't belong to the kingdom of the world. It belongs to the kingdom of, the, of heaven. And this happiness is completely opposite to the happiness that the world offers. That's why if they see us here speaking about the Beatitudes and coming to the Beatitudes and meditating in the Beatitudes, the world would say, these people are crazy. How is this going to give them happiness? But it's because we look for happiness that comes from on high, not the one that comes from from the bottom. The bottom is the flesh, the top is the love of God. And so the Lord says, the first beatitude. I love the first beatitude. Well, I love it so much that I wrote a letter about that first one. Blessed are the poor, blessed. Blessed. The Lord came to proclaim blessedness. The good news. The gospel is good news. For some, it's bad news. But for Christians, we understand what good news is when the Lord says, walk the narrow path, because the narrow path is the path of salvation. For many, it's, it's bad news. We understand it. We understand that when we want wideness, amplitude, pleasures, we go through the wide path. 
how many consequences for our souls, even for our relationships, how many vocations, ma married to marriage, priestly, religious are lost when we begin to look for the wide path. The narrow path is what keeps us straight, following Jesus. The good thing is about the narrow path is that you can't go left or you can't go right because you'll fall. And that's what the Lord is telling us. Is behind me. Exactly. Doing everything I tell you. Well, the Lord says, Blessed the poor of spirit. Because theirs, the kingdom of God is theirs. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What dynamics do you see in the Beatitudes? How does it begin? Blessing. Who? And what is the recompense? That's the dynamic. There's a triple dynamic in every beatitude. The first thing that the Lord announces is this that I'm going to tell you that's going to give you happiness. And that's what He says. Blessing. But also, notice that the Lord doesn't impose. He invites. Notice how He says it. Blessed are the poor in spirit, those who accept in their hearts to live poverty of spirit. They're going to go receive the kingdom of heaven. The Lord came to establish the kingdom of heaven. What he's saying is that those who are poor in spirit are going to belong fully and they will receive all the treasures of the kingdom. Those who renounce the treasures, and I'm not speaking about material ones, the ones that, that dis dispossess, the ones that don't, are not attached to anything. Everything's attachment nowadays. Those who are not attached to anything, who love intensely, but live, who love freely. That's how Christians we have to live and love. L love freely and intensely. People. Things creation that God has given us. We have to love and care, but with freedom. The person that is dispossessed of everything receives everything. That's what the Lord is saying. In reality, it's a great business. You get disposed. It's not like you remain without anything. It's an interior attitude that I don't need to use such a brand to have importance. No, brand and sisters. If you have the greatest <laughs> brand in the world, you have the brand of the seal of God. You are a son and daughter of God. With one nice shirt, with a brand or not brand, you are exactly the same. And you are worth exactly the same. I'm not against that you use things brand of brand names, but what I'm saying is that who thinks that the values are by the brand, who follows just brand names, we're like horses, horses and cows, that by the brand that I have, the seal that I have, I, I know who I belong to. No, the brand that we have, that we're children of God, and no one or anyone can increase value. My value is the greatest that exists because we are the children of the Father. The ones who are not attached do not remain empty. The Lord and Our Lady said in the Magnificat, the Lord fills with great things, notice with great things, those who, those who, are empty. When we empty ourselves of all those things that fill our heart unnecessarily, we have, I don't know how to say this in so many cultures, but we have so many, so many limits. Like if I don't eat at 12.30, I can't survive, especially Hispanics. If I don't eat at certain time, if I don't eat certain food, and that's why Jesus has so many teachings about food. It's not that they didn't eat. He fasted 40 days. But what he's saying is that there's more important things in life than food. And sometimes by being attached to the food, we're missing out on the important things. And so the Lord wants us to 
be dis dispossessed of the attachments. Not that we don't enjoy a great plate of food, but if I don't have it, it's okay. And that if something important I have to eat is a little burger, then I'm just as happy. That, to be unattached to the earthly things, is the one that makes us taste, taste the things of heaven. Why do people get bored in Mass? Because they're thinking, oh, an hour here, how boring. I can watch the football game, I can be at the mall. We are, our house is full of so many things, of so many earthly things, or even of worries when I say, if we're so worried, well, let's go to the Lord to present the worries. We're so full of so many things that the Lord can't enter. And we saw this in, in, in Bethlehem. The houses were full, and so the Lord couldn't enter into any of those homes. The same thing happens with us, and that's why He says, Blessed are they who empty themselves, the ones who don't, are not attached to anything, and that they have their hearts completely free for the Lord, for everything that the Lord wants to give. Because God wants to give the greatest. And what's the greatest that He gives is the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. And so we can have a whole course about every beatitude. I'm not going to have you here a month. We're going to go to the next one. And so what, what happens here? The importance of asking here is first, look at yourselves interiorly. What do I give so much importance to? It's a fundamental question we have to ask ourselves. What do I give so much importance to? That without that, it seems like the world end, has ended and that I'm missing something, something's lacking in my life. Brothers and sisters, the only thing that we can stop living is with, we, we can't live without God. So if we have God, we have everything. But however, if I don't have my coffee at 3 p.m., I can't survive. Well, I'm not against coffee. I like coffee. But if at 3 p.m. we're praying and you can't have your coffee, how many people leave? to go have coffee. Notice? So, our values. Here we have to ask ourselves, what do I give a high importance in my life? And evaluate it in the light of the poverty of spirit. And evaluate it if that could even be an obstacle to your communion with God. The second, imagine. The world detests us for this. Even Christians don't like this one. <laughs> Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. In the English translation, it's the fifth verse, but in the Spanish, apparently, it's the fourth verse. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Imagine. Blessed are the meek. Who are the meek? Define to me meekness. Mm -hmm. Those who allow themselves to be taken. Imagine that. Those who allow themselves to be taken or led. It's the opposite of being rebels, of doing whatever I want. Nope. Mm -mm. Don't touch me. Opposite to all that is meekness. Me meekness is, that's why he's speaking about himself. The Lord allowed himself to be led. To be led and taken by the soldiers the, and to the house of Caiaphas. And then they threw him in the hole where he spent an entire night and we're going to be there. And he went in silence. Lamb of God, the meek Lamb of God. Meekness is the style of life, of total docility to the will of the Lord. Mother, but what is the will of God? But first and foremost, it's very simple. The will of God begins by the duties of your vocation. Well, but today he didn't say good morning to me. I'm not going to cook to I'm not going to cook for him. Well, I give examples of what I hear. 
Is that meekness? No. Meekness is the opposite to self-defense. And brothers and sisters, the one who is not meek will harden the heart so much that he becomes a rebel. To be a rebel is product of not having meekness, not having docility. That's why I'm so proud of you because you were on time today in the bus. And when I said we go in front of the church, we meet there, and you were there in five minutes, that's meekness. Believe it or not, that's why it's good to have pilgrimage, apart from all the things, because we learn the virtues that perhaps in our own families we're not living them, but because we have someone telling us, follow this path, go here, be at this time. And that going there, spending the entire day, entering and functioning as a body, stop thinking about oneself, oh, I've got to go brush my teeth, I like 20 minutes brushing my teeth, people are waiting for me. No. We're used to the eye, but since we're various days pilgrimaging in groups, we begin to think of the common good. And so we begin to enter into docility, in meekness. Now, meekness is not being dumb. In Spanish, it's a saying, meek but not dumb, and I agree 100%. Menso. Manso, pero no menso. I'm a nun, but not mensa. Meekness is not following anyone. Not being docile also to just anyone. Because if there's someone who's asking you to do something contrary to your conscience or contrary to the word of the Lord and the magisterium of the church, you can't be docile to that person. We see it in the Acts of the Apostles. And so, what does meekness mean? Docility to do the good at all moments. Mother, but that old lady told me something and I want to tell her off. Well, turn around, pray in our Father, calm down. And to get angry about this is normal, but calm down, pray in our Father for that lady, for that old lady, okay, for that, pray in our Father for that lady, and calm down. But don't tell her anything. Don't answer with the same coin that she answered you. Don't return what she did to you. Because in the Lord says, well, with the measure which with you measure, you will be measured. If they give you a stick, don't go with another stick because the Lord is going to come to you with a stick. Meekness is not returning evil with evil, but returning evil with the good. And St. Paul says that evil is overcome by the strength of the good, but also evil is necessary, I'm sorry, meekness is necessary to be open to the will of God. Brothers and sisters, if there's no meekness, we don't know what to do during the pilgrimage. We can be on the boat and pass by the shore. But to listen, what does the Lord want to say is what's guiding us. When we go to the lake and say, Lord, what do you... As Mother was saying, listening to what the Lord wanted to tell you all. But that's not because we planned it. We were docile to the Holy Spirit because we're not here to to transmit our own idea, ideas, but we're here to listen to the Lord. And so, did you understand meekness a little bit? Is docility to do to always do the good? Docility to always do the good. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Brothers and sisters, how, what a beautiful beatitude. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now, I want you to know, not all tears are beatitudes. I have a talk, you can enter in the, in the webpage. I have a talk about the tears. 
and I do a definition of the tears. Not all tears are beatitudes. The one who cries out of pride will not be comforted. The one who cries out of rage will not be comforted. The one who cries because they didn't do what I wanted to get be done, people cry about this. That person will not be comforted. Not all tears are consoled, but the blessed one. And what are the blessed tears? The ones that are shed out of love, first and foremost, out of love. When we're emotional thinking about the Lord and we cry, when we see the pain and suffering of our brothers and sisters and our compassion is so much that we're united when we're one with the suffering of our brother and sister, that's a super be blessed tear because it's a tear of charity, of compassion. When we cry for the loss of a loved one, that's a tear, that's a, that's a beatitude. Jesus cried. Jesus cried for his cousin Lazarus, his, his friend Lazarus who would be raised. And we're going to leave that for Bethany when we visit. But we have to say, Lord, here's another fundamental question. Why do I cry? What makes me cry? I cry for the sufferings of my brothers and sisters here in the Middle East that they're being persecuted, decapitated. Do I cry for that? Or do I cry for my own countries that were under a great scourging of communism? Do we cry for the sufferings of our brothers and sisters? We have to suffer and enflesh the sufferings of our brothers and sisters. And when that makes me cry, and it's not only the physical crying, but when I suffer, crying means when I suffer in my own heart, and it moves me to a response to whatever in the measure that I can. Perhaps I'm not going to solve all the problems of the world, but perhaps I can help two families. Those tears that that its foundation is love are the tears that will be comforted the the tears of a mother because her son is in the wrong path the tears of a widow a widower the tears related to love are the beatitudes the other tears will not be consoled. But what does it mean that when we are in that pain, we are in that suffering, either it be our own suffering or other suffering, that our compassion is so real that it makes us feel, like St. Paul said, crying with those who cry and suffer with those who suffer. That, that's what it means to be a body. If your head hurts, then all of you feel bad, right? If a tooth hurts, you will feel bad, right? Well, if the mystical body of Christ is suffering, how am I not going to feel bad? How am I not going to cry? How am I not going to feel pain and suffering? And so, let us ask ourselves here, why do we cry? Because I've seen tears of all kinds. I've seen people cry because the shoe that they wanted to buy doesn't come in the size that they, their size. And so here you realize that not even the first beatitude nor the second beatitude nor the third beatitude is lived. See? And so we laugh, but that's how we are. How terrible that we lower ourselves so much when we're called to be so elevated. How terrible and how much the Lord and Our Lady must suffer and cry. When we were created, to be image and presence of them, image and presence of God. And we almost like go in the mud like the swine. There's a strong word of the Lord. And when you hear it, it's like, wow, the Lord went out of hand. But every time I hear it, He was right to have said it. When He says that the swine re or the dogs, the dogs return to their vomit. And I think, gross, that's horrible. Why did you say that? I spent a couple years in my youth like, like saying, that's disgusting. Why did the Lord say that? Well, brothers and sisters, as life passes, how much I see that this is a true reality for us. When we say, 
I'm gonna get out of selfishness and a month back we return. We go back to the vomit of selfishness. I'm not gonna be I'm not gonna gossip anymore. I've decided I'm not gonna gossip anymore. And it lasts two weeks. And two weeks later we return to the vomit of gossip. You find the one that you gossip with the most. And the Lord sent her to you. The Lord sent her to you to see if your determination was certain. And then you say, oh, it's because I couldn't. I couldn't hold myself because I, I met Carmen. But sisters, that's going back to our vomit. And the worst thing is we say, oh, I couldn't, when we have the grace of God to live in holiness and, and virtue. Why don't we say, I was so stubborn, that's why the Lord uses the word stubborn, stubborn all the time. I was so stubborn that we don't live in our own dignity. I am not that. I am not a dog that returns to my vomit. No, I have to, I can't go to my past, to the old self. I have to climb the mountain to attain being a new creation. Blessed are those who are hunger and thirsty for what? Not coffee or fish, even though we're going to go eat fish, but who are hungry and thirsty for justice. What is that? Well, since justice is an abused word, some don't use it for anything. For some, justice should not be used. Everything's mercy. But, but a, a mercy without justice is disordered. For some, mercy is, oh, the poor people. Let's leave them like that. And let's love them and embrace them. Yeah, you have to embrace the sinner, but you have to help that person get out of that sin. And so justice is what tells you you can't, that person can't maintain a state of sin because no one pure can be before the presence of God. And so mercy is what Jesus said, that he detained the works from St. Mary Magdalene. He protected the life of a famous adulterer prostitute. What mercy, Lord? But he protected her and he didn't say, okay, go, 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 and continue being a prostitute. No. He said, go and sin no more. Mercy with justice. And so for some sec Christian sectors that justice does not exist, God is merciful and they forget the other 15 attributes of God, beginning that God is just. And it's true that His mercy, yes, He is merciful, that His mercy sometimes goes beyond His justice. And we have to give thanks because if I was God, years ago, I would have sent something very difficult in the world. It's going to have to come if we don't change. And we're not changing. We're going worse and worse and worse. But there's going to be a time where God and His justice will not be able to allow out of our own good that we continue in this state of anarchy of sin. And so who are the ones who are hungry and thirsty for righteousness, for the for those, those who look for balance. Justice is balance. Those who look for at every moment the mercy of God, but that it leads to a true freedom. Also justice is, is to worry about the common good. If I worry only about my things, I am unjust. But if I worry about what's lacking in the other and I share what I have, I am a just person. If I know that seeing the situation in life, and for example, a person is in the bathroom and is holding up the bus. This person's always late, my goodness. And instead of thinking first, wait, maybe that person has an emergency. And to get off the bus, 
and say, is something okay? No, I just came here now. Well, next time, you have to get on the bus. But what's the first thought? It can't be to label that person. The labels on people should never be given. It's given to the act. Are we clear about this? That's an idiot. No, we never say that. No, that person did an act that wasn't wise. But does it mean that that person's an idiot? So justice is what balances your way of relating with others. Are you understanding? Because there's much that can be explained about this and I don't have much time. The next one. And so wait, what was the promise of those who are righteous? They shall be satisfied. Those who worry about their brothers and sisters. This is my argument with with the communists and now they're called socialists, like kind of like to change the name, but it's the same concept to make it softer sounding. That injustice, we have to overcome it. Yes, we have to overcome injustice. And I would say just like them, but not like how you're thinking. Because you think that injustice is to put the rich against the, the poor and the poor against the rich. No, on the contrary, justice is overcome by uniting the rich with the poor person and making them brothers and sisters because we need the ones who have the means to create jobs for the poor. If there aren't people with the economic means and God didn't provide us with people with economic means and who's going to build the offices, the businesses where work is given to the poor people. And apart from that, when one sees who did that school, it was that, that person who donated this to build a school. Well, that person had to have the means to donate that school for the poor children or to, do an, or to build an orphanage. Justice is not to create opposition, but rather justice is to create unity. And justice is to create division. Now, I want to say something else that St. Paul said, that the greatest injustice, listen to this, like since we live in times of much confusion, the greatest injustice is not to proclaim the truth. And now they say, don't say this, don't insist on the gospel, don't proclaim it, leave them there. What do you mean leave them there? If the Lord says, go out and proclaim, make disciples of all nations. If you find it in the gospel, please tell me, so I cannot say anything else. But the Lord at no moment said, don't tell anyone anything about me. Because whatever way they can be saved, they can be saved. Did the Lord say this? No, He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And the one who comes to me, he didn't say the one, just anyone, no. The one who comes to me, I will take him to the Father. And so, brothers and sisters, that's why St. Paul said that in the greatest injustice was to deny the truth to those who do not know it, to deny the gospel to those who do not know it. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Who are the merciful? Those who do not close the heart before the evils received, but rather dedicate themselves to oppose that evil, always doing the good. And that's why the Lord, who is divine mercy himself, how does he appear to reveal his divine mercy? with his heart open and from there gushing forth blood and water the rays of mercy why does he have the heart open because they pierced him in Calvary with a sword he was already dead mind you it's not like it wasn't necessary to re-kill him they they pierced his heart to make sure he was dead and so 
a double hatred. And how does the Lord respond to so much evil? When they pierce his heart to re-kill him, he, even, a, even after death, he continues giving life. Because love is stronger than death. And he continues giving life after death. I got goosebumps. And blood and water gush forth. Symbolizing the two great sacraments of baptism and the Eucharist. But also symbolizing the rays of mercy. Mercy is that. They pierce my heart. And what do I do with that pain? What do I do with that pain? Do I allow that wound to become rotten with rancor? To become affected or do I offer it? Or do I try to see what fountain is being opened through this pain and suffering? Because every wound, the Lord told me, from all His wounds, open fountains, like I did. And so all of us are pierced perhaps almost every day, maybe in different ways, or in different ways of swords, sizes of swords. But what do I decide to do with that pain and suffering? If you transform it in a fountain that brings life, I am merciful. I am merciful. When I can forgive, brothers and sisters, there's Christians who go to Mass every day and they say, I can't forgive. I can't forgive. Brothers and sisters, how can we say that? What an anti-gospel to tell me that it's hard for me to forgive? That's normal. Yes, of course it's hard for us to forgive when an evil is done, especially an unjust evil is done against us. That comes something else. We can spend another hour with this. But not all evils that are done to us are unjust. Sometimes we look for those. Sometimes we go to a place and we're with people. They're not good. And when they do the evil to us, we're in the victims. And who told you to hang around these people? Part of having wisdom. But and sisters, if we are merciful, that is, if we are not quick in labeling and judging and closing the human heart, I don't even speak to that person anymore. No. When our hearts are open to give life, even though it hurts, the Lord will do the same with us. He already did it, but He will do it personally with each one of us. He will be merciful. And for the Lord, mercy is fundamental. He speaks about it throughout the entire Gospel. Blessed are the clean of heart. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Oh, there's another beautiful one for me. Blessed are the pure clean in heart, for they shall see God. What does this mean? What does it mean to have a pure, clean heart? <laughs> Whose intentions are pure. They don't have a hidden agenda. That their intentions are pure. To do things, everything out of love. It seems easy, right? But it's not. It's not easy. I'm going to be friends with such and such person because that person is the owner of this and so that that person can invite me. That's not a pure heart. But and sisters, the pure heart is innocent. It's the heart of a child that the Lord speaks of so much. And only the children can enter the kingdom of heaven. Not the ones who are childish. Not the ones who are childish. Christians, we have to be mature. But mature with hearts that are like ch child's heart. Innocent hearts. And sisters, we have to make a decision here. Because the heart can become dirty for many things. 
what we hear, what we see because of the environment and our own choices. But the Lord says, only the one that has a pure heart can, can, shall see God here on earth and also in heaven. That's why if we're not very purified, we have to cleanse ourselves a bit and that is called purgatory. And purgatory is a gift of mercy. What, what I had to clean here, I have to go to purgatory to wash and then there they're going to really clean me up. And that's why purgatory hurts. That's why it's better to be purified here on earth and accept everything that we live and go through first as a purse of purification but also as an offering because the Lord what he allows me here on earth is to purify us either we purify ourselves here or we go to purgatory to finish purification I prefer here because in purgatory I, they're gonna hit me hard and I'm not gonna have the best sacrament I'm waiting I'm safe I'm getting to heaven but I'm being very purified, I don't have Our Lady, I don't have the Blessed Sacrament, and so I'd rather be purified here on earth. Those are the only ones that can make good discernment, the ones who have a pure heart. Why? Because they're innocent, because they don't have a hidden agenda, they're, all, they're not full of their own will, because they're not filled with self-love. And so what happens when sisters, they can see the will of God with freedom and that's why it means they can they can see me they can understand everything about God understand his word to be before the blessed sacrament to believe that that's the real presence of the Lord those are the hearts of children knowing that Jesus is present there in the Eucharist and that's why the Eucharist is white I'm glad that he, he liked white bread because that's where the pure of heart is giving himself for us Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. That's the best title. Sons of God. Who are the sons of God? The ones who are the pa not the pacifists, the ones who are passive. The peacemaker, pacifista, that are not always in self-defense that they say one word and already you go and attack. They don't even let you talk and then they answer. Wait, let me finish what I'm saying. I wasn't saying anything against you. The world today is so aggressive, brothers and sisters, that we have an aggressive culture. And what do we have to do? We have to be able to make our hearts peaceful so we can make the culture peaceful. So where do wars, wars come from? Yesterday that we were speaking about war. Where do wars come from? From the heart of man. And who decides it? Man does. And so, let not, but for war not to come, there have to be hearts that look for peace. And to have peace as a fundamental value. Now, now, what doesn't get postponed, we don't propose, postpone everything for peace. In order to have peace, I'm not going to say that I'm a Christian so that they're not angry at me. No, that's a false peace. Because at the same time, the Lord said, I come to bring the sword and bring division. So how do we put this beatitude with this word? How do we match this beatitude with that word? Peace is fruit of the Holy Spirit. And peace is fruit of living in God and with God. And so we can find peace or create peace. They try treaties, they try decrees, they sign and they sign. And, and they continue bombing each other. Because a piece of paper or a treaty brings peace. Wonderful that they sign it, at least they're giving a gesture there. But peace is from the human heart. And we are the first ones who have to learn to be peacemakers, not to be aggressive, not to answer back. 
If there's two who are fighting, come here, let's speak. What's going on? What's going on? And to look for reconciliation in the measure possible. There's some that don't want to be reconciled, fine. But we have to seek peace and be transmitters of peace. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and speak poorly of you. Great, what a joy. That's difficult, right? When someone hits you and hits you and doesn't leave you alone and continues speaking poorly, thank you, Lord. I praise you for that person. I praise you. We have to say it like a hundred times until it reaches the human heart because we have to be capable of rejoicing not with emotional joy like last night that we cracked up with the stories no into your joy which is to say you are allowing this persecution because there's something that you want to do in me or either you're allowing it because you're setting something apart and so in that process of those setting those things apart I have to go through this, this storm and that's a joy that the Lord doesn't allow us a persecution a suffering an injustice or any or persecution isn't he speaking about what his life is going to be in Jerusalem because it's for a greater good and the greater good was of the greater good of his persecution of the injuries of being wounded scourged was to die on the cross and save us and that's why he says rejoice because even though it's difficult there will be a greater good at the end rejoice rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven for so men per the more we're persecuted by being faithful to the Lord our recompense will be great, will be great in heaven. We can't even imagine what's that greatness of heaven. But and sisters, these eight steps are helping us climb. Don't try to climb all eight at the same time. Go in the order of the Lord. Even when you pray, pray in the order of the Beatitudes because one builds another like if you're missing one you're you're missing another these eight steps and the eight is the number of the father take us to the kingdom of heaven and so here the lord came not only to speak about the kingdom of heaven but he came to teach us to live in the kingdom of heaven and the portrait of the kingdom which is the portrait of Christ himself because he is the kingdom of heaven are the beatitudes may the Lord bless you abundantly